My name is Max Feinstein and I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist here to answer your questions about anesthesiology. This video was inspired by the Ask an Expert series on Wired and these great questions came from viewers on my YouTube channel and Instagram. The first question comes from Town in Louie and that question is, every drug used for general anesthesia from start to finish, upside down smiley face. Before we answer this question, let's first just define what general anesthesia means, because there can be a lot of confusion around this term. Based on the definition from the American Society of Anesthesiologists, general anesthesia simply means that when something painful is done to a patient, they don't respond. That's it. It doesn't have anything to say about whether a patient is intubated or not. And in fact, it's not unusual for a patient to be breathing on their own under general anesthesia for a procedure like a colonoscopy. Although, of course, in many circumstances, we do place a breathing tube or an endotracheal tube for patients who are under general anesthesia to assist with breathing. Going back to the question, the answer can really vary dramatically depending on the procedure, the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and the patient's preferences. On a very simple side of things, it's actually possible to achieve general anesthesia with one single drug. This is done sometimes for colonoscopies with just propofol. You can get to a depth of general anesthesia without anything else. In pediatric anesthesia, we can also accomplish the same thing with an inhaled medication called sevoflurane, which can be used as the sole agent for patients who are having ear tubes or tympanostomy tubes that are done. But if we were to look at a common procedure like a cholecystectomy, which is having a gallbladder taken out, then the usual assortment of medications might include something along the lines of starting with midazolam, or the trade name is Versed, which is an anxiolytic. It helps patients feel comfortable. The midazolam is often administered prior to going into the operating room. And then once we get into the OR, then we would administer, say, a little bit of fentanyl to help reduce the response from a patient being intubated five minutes later. Also administer lidocaine, which would help reduce the pain from propofol, which comes next. Propofol can feel painful when it's injected into a vein, and there are different strategies that we can use to reduce that pain, lidocaine being one of them through the IV. Then after lidocaine comes propofol. After propofol, which renders a patient unconscious, so now they're under general anesthesia, then we would administer a medication that's a muscle relaxant, which would make it easy to place a breathing tube through the vocal cords. A common example of that would be rocuronium, followed by a medication called dexamethasone, which is a steroid, which is commonly used to help reduce post-operative nausea and vomiting, and can also take away some of the discomfort from being intubated, which can last for a couple of days. During a surgery, the patient will continue to receive propofol, or they might receive an inhaled medication like isoflurane or sevoflurane. And then once the surgery is starting to wrap up, the patient might commonly receive ondansetron, trade name Zofran, which is another anti-nausea medication, followed by a reversal medication for the paralytic. So rocuronium can be reversed with a couple of different medications. One of those is called neostigmine, which has to be administered with a medication called glycopyrrolate to counterbalance some of the effects. Or alternatively, a newer medication to reverse muscle relaxant is Sugamidex, trade name Brideon. And after that, we stop administering whatever medication is keeping the patient under general anesthesia, wake them up, and head back to the recovery room after we've taken out the breathing tube. I'll just put a footnote on this answer and say that there is a lot of practice variation and many different ways to accomplish general anesthesia. What I presented here is just an example of what I might do for a straightforward cholecystectomy. The next question comes from Calvi347, who asked, asystole after Sugamidex? So I think the question here is asking for me to talk a little bit about whether this is something I've observed and what the risk of this is. We were just talking about Sugamidex. So this is a medication that reverses paralysis. And Sugamidex is very widely used because it's a very effective medication. As I just mentioned, there's an alternative to Sugamidex that's called neostigmine. Now, in medicine, there's no free lunch. So any medication is going to have some side effects. Generally speaking, when you compare the side effect profile of neostigmine with the side effect profile of Sugamidex, 
So Gamadex tends to be the safer drug. And it's not just my opinion. There was a review that was done that came to this conclusion, and I put a link in the description below so you can check out that review yourself. Having said that, there is definitely a known risk factor for the heart rate to slow down when a patient receives Sugamidex. And in fact, it can slow down to the point of causing the heart to stop beating. I just want to emphasize that this is incredibly rare and has been written about in a couple of case reports, which I've also included in a link down below. This does not mean that I would avoid giving Sugamidex. Every single medication that's involved in anesthesiology does have some sort of serious side effect, including IV fluid. It's possible for someone to receive a dangerous amount of IV fluid. But my point is that any medication that's administered by an anesthesiologist just needs to be done thoughtfully and while a patient is under close monitoring. The next question comes from Fred7A73, who asks, have you ever responded to another anesthesiologist call for help? Yes, I have. I have responded to calls for help for relatively straightforward issues like difficulty with IV placement, all the way to much more serious issues like cardiac arrest. And personally, I have also called others for help. I have a very low threshold to do that because ultimately the most important thing is patient safety. And if I'm having trouble doing something, need another set of hands, another set of eyes, someone else to help me think through an issue, I don't have any ego about it. I just want to have additional help so that we can take care of the patient as safely as possible. Next up, DJ6040 says, I am a paramedic intern and my question is being that anesthesia is often the 911 of the hospital and dealing with emergencies regularly. What advice do you have for junior providers in an emergency setting? Tips for managing the scene, leadership, and keeping yourself steady. First, I would say study hard and trust your training. Once you have memorized all of the guidelines for how to treat various emergencies, then when those emergencies unfold in front of your eyes, you don't have time to think about things, but you have already internalized how you would approach, for example, a cardiac arrest, and so you just start going through the ACLS algorithm. And while it can be intimidating the first few times that you do this, the more that you encounter these situations and the more you realize that you can just trust your training to work through any emergency, the calmer you can be as you're dealing with these emergencies. As far as managing the scene and leadership are concerned, whenever there's an emergency, it's really important to have good communication among everyone who's involved in responding. And so if there is not already an identified leader for taking charge of managing the emergency, then you might consider nominating yourself and letting everyone know that you're going to be directing the code, for example, or suggesting that someone else might do that. So there can be a clear delineation of communication for everyone involved. My other piece of advice is just to reiterate that if ever you feel like you need help, it's never too early to call a colleague and ask them to weigh in or ask them to help you out with something. It's always better to call early and have extra people there than to call too late for help and wish that you had people there, but they're not. The next question comes from Leon Feskins, who asks, which alarm induces tachycardia the fastest in you? Tachycardia being a fast heart rate. So the first answer that comes to mind is my alarm clock, but I'm assuming we're talking about at work. So I would say the sound of a patient becoming hypoxic. And what I mean by that is there's a constant beep in the background in the operating room that has a certain pitch. That pitch corresponds with the patient's oxygen saturation. So when the pitch of that beep starts to go down, my heart rate starts to go up because there's something that is causing this patient to not have as much oxygen in their blood as they should. Although sometimes it's just an issue with the monitor itself and the monitor needs to be repositioned and the patient is actually fine. The next question is from Daily Motivation Gym Memes, who asks, what are the steps to become an anesthesiologist? I'm gonna take this opportunity to highlight the fact that anesthesiologists are physicians, which is not necessarily something that everybody realizes. So the path to become an anesthesiologist depends on what country you live in. So I'll speak to where I live in the United States. Here, after you finish high school, you have to do a four-year college degree, and you have to take 
pre-medical classes. You can either do that in college or you can do that after you've graduated from college. After that, you apply for medical school, which is an additional four years. And during the fourth year of medical school, prior to graduating, you enter what is called the match, where you apply for residency in anesthesiology and then match into an anesthesiology residency program. Residency itself is four years, and then after that point, you can either start practicing as an anesthesiologist or you can pursue additional subspecialty training. I'll also just mention that in the United States, there are several other types of healthcare providers who are involved with the delivery of anesthesia, and that includes CRNAs, so Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetists, who become nurses, then typically work for at least a few years in an ICU as a nurse, and then subsequently apply for a nurse anesthesia program, which is three or three and a half years, after which they become a CRNA. And in many, but not all of the states, there are certified anesthesiologist assistants who complete a four-year college degree program and then subsequently a two-and-a-half-year master's degree program and then can work as anesthesia assistants. The next question comes from Min Seika, who is a friend of mine and an anesthesiology resident, who said, Hey Max, what was your thought process like in deciding to do fellowships? So as I mentioned, it is possible to finish anesthesia residency and then go straight into practice or pursue additional subspecialty training, which is known as doing a fellowship. In my case, while I was in residency, I initially thought that I might want to do a fellowship in intensive care medicine. There are a number of different residency programs that allow you to become an intensivist afterwards, and anesthesiology is one of them. For the most part, anesthesiologists work in surgical ICUs and cardiothoracic ICUs, although there's a lot of variation around this. I'll also mention that in many other countries, anesthesiologists work in ICUs and the operating room by default. It's not as split up as it is in the United States. So anyways, I was initially thinking about that, but then during my second year of residency, I got to work with some wonderful pediatric anesthesiologists who helped me think about why that might be a great fit for me. So in short, things that I love about pediatric anesthesia, number one is that the procedures can be very challenging if you think about how small the arteries and veins are. So putting in IVs and arterial lines can be particularly challenging and I really enjoy that. As well as airway management can be challenging because pediatric airways can be so small. I also really like the fact that, broadly speaking, the environment in a pediatric operating room tends to be particularly patient-centric and particularly friendly. I also really enjoy trying to figure out how best to connect with the patient and their parents, and there can be a lot of variation in terms of what attitude a patient brings to the hospital. So a five-year-old might be very different from a 10-year-old and also very different from a 15-year-old and so forth. So trying to quickly establish what it is that is going to make them comfortable, help them trust me, and then get them safely back to the operating room and start the anesthesia is something that I really enjoy. Fast forward to when I was doing my pediatric anesthesiology fellowship, and I found myself really gravitating towards the cardiothoracic anesthesia cases. I really enjoy the physiology and the anatomy that patients with congenital heart disease have something that I find to be really thought-provoking and requires a lot of critical thinking at work. So after I completed my PEDS anesthesia fellowship, I did one additional fellowship in PEDS cardiac anesthesia, which now is exclusively what I practice. The next question comes from Darian Tunstall, who asks, what's the best part of being an anesthesiologist? To answer this question, I want to paint a picture for you. Start at the beginning of the day, I walk in to meet my patient, a young child who's there with their parents. The parents are extremely anxious and understandably so because their child is about to undergo a very big surgery on their heart. So fast forward, after the surgery, everything's gone well. We drop the patient off in the ICU. My favorite part of the day and really my favorite part of being an anesthesiologist is walking back to the lounge where the parents are waiting and as soon as I make eye contact with them, giving them two big thumbs up and then letting them know that everything went well and they'll be able to come back and see their child in short order. Next comes from AMR Luca who says, talk about substance abuse among anesthesiologists. So this is a really serious topic of course and it's a really insightful prompt here because substance abuse among anesthesiologists really is a significant issue. 
based on an old study that looked at anesthesiology residents, a little bit less than one out of every 100 residents dealt with a diagnosed substance abuse issue during residency. This is just during the training period, and there are some pretty significant limitations for this type of study that probably underestimate the number of individuals affected. Presumably one of the reasons that substance use is relatively higher among anesthesiologists than practitioners of other specialties is the fact that we have very easy access to very powerful medications. One of the drugs of abuse historically has been the class of opioids and particularly fentanyl. But more recently, there's been an uptick in the amount of abuse of propofol. Unfortunately, the presentation of propofol abuse in more than half of cases is death. So this is an incredibly serious issue that deserves a lot of attention. The risk factors that have been studied for substance abuse among anesthesiologists includes male gender, psychiatric illness, a family history of substance misuse, prior history of treatment, and no longer being in a treatment program. There are a couple of studies that I've included in the description below if you'd like to read more information about this really important topic. Joshua Heller, 8543, asks, do surgeons ever give you a hard time or make your job more difficult? I am very fortunate to say that I work with very collaborative surgeons who understand that whenever I'm taking a long time to place an IV, for example, that's not because I want to take a long time, it's because the IV is hard to place. Having said that, I have worked in the past with some surgeons who have been a little bit antagonistic, although to be fair, I have also worked with anesthesiologists who can be antagonistic as well, so I think this is more a question of human nature than it is about any one particular surgeon or anesthesiologist. The next question comes from So Many Owls, a friend of mine who is a surgeon, who asks, do you still do haircuts? The reason that he's asking this is because I cut his hair during COVID and I did not do a very good job, so I can understand why he's interested in knowing the answer to this question. And I'm happy to report that I am still cutting hair, although I've transitioned from cutting human hair to cutting dog hair. I cut both of my dog's hair and it's a work in progress. The last question comes from MD Ogan who asks, what's your most and least favorite medical department apart from anesthesiology? Well, at the risk of stoking any egos here, I have to say that the work that pediatric cardiothoracic surgeons do is incredibly impressive and I love peering over the drapes and watching surgery happen. So that's probably my favorite other medical specialty. My least favorite specialty, I have friends who work in this specialty, so I mean them no disrespect at all, but really just from a logistical standpoint, it is challenging for me when I have worked with interventional pulmonologists through no fault of their own, sometimes they end up needing to inject a lot of water into the patient's lungs, which obviously makes my job a little more challenging. So again, I don't mean any disrespect to the interventional pulmonologists. They do really important work, but it can be challenging when I have cases with them, depending on what they're doing. If you enjoyed this video and you have questions you'd like to hear me address in a follow-up video, then please put them in a comment down below or let the staff at Wired know that perhaps they could do a collaboration with me. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.